All right, podcast listeners, welcome to another episode of Thriving Dog Podcast. Today on the show, I'm lucky to have Rita Hogan. Rita is a canine herbalist. She's also co-founder of Farm Dog Naturals, along with her co-founder, Lynn Higgins, and a writer with published articles in Dogs Naturally Magazine. And she's also working on three new books of her own, all about canine herbs as applied to our canine friends. Uh, So Rita's journey as an herbalist started way back when she was just a kid, wild rafting with her father. And she combined her love of herbs with her love of dogs and then dedicated herself to a canine-centered herbalist. She lives in Olympia, Washington, where she started writing her first of three books, as I mentioned earlier. And you can learn all about Rita at canineherbalist.com or their product company, uh, farmdognaturals.com. You can also follow her on Instagram uh, or at farmdognaturals on Instagram at farmdognaturals. So Rita, welcome. Hi, how are you? Good. So why don't you take a second to fill in anything I might have missed there and we'll get right into things. Actually, I think you did a really good job. So yeah, I'm a dog-centered herbalist, so I work with specifically dogs. So I don't really work with cats or goats or rabbits or horses, but just specifically with dogs. And I have for, I'm going probably, I think, in the middle of my 19th year. So. Okay. All right. And you and I first met at the Raw and Natural Dog Show last year in Chicago. And, um, you know, for folks who might not have, you know, a, a super intimate um, relationship or experience with kind of the alternative holistic side of, of, of canine care, um, you know, they might be wondering, what does a canine herbalist do? So I thought it'd be really helpful if we could, if you could kind of set the stage and maybe paint a picture for us of, you know, a, a, a recent um, dog that you've treated and worked with and how they came to you, how you treated uh, them and kind of what their results were. And of course, we'll get into all sorts of things about you know, the, the principles that, that you work from and that our audience can benefit from. So is there, you know, a, a story out there of a, a dog who, who, who comes to mind that you've worked with recently that our, our audience might be able to relate to? Yeah, sure. Um, so as a canine herbalist, uh, I don't treat anything. So we, uh, we uh, don't treat disease. Um, we work with balancing the body. So we work with the systems of the body and um, uh, we let our veterinarians treat uh, disease, but um, we work with the systems of the body to find the root issue um, of what's going on. So um, I use herbs to balance out the body and I look at dogs as an individual and as an ecosystem. So um, I look at also uh, as plants as uh, individuals as well um, and based on a system of energetics and, um, and kind of looking at how plants work and how, how dogs work together and matching um, matching the plant to the individual dog. And so like a good example of that is a, a current client of mine um, is, was a, I would say like a hound mix. It's a hound mix and um, came to me um, when veterinary care just wasn't working. And so the dog had about 80% of hair loss, um, oozing sores, uh, smelled highly um, yeasty, um, um, kind of had like uh, scabbed over um, pus on the neck and um, mm. really thin, unable to gain weight. Um, and so I work with the dog and, um, and of course these, these types, I mean, this is more of a severe case, but I see a lot of dogs with, with severe chronic disease. And um, so we worked very slowly at introducing some herbs that I felt um, would start to balance out the skin. And a lot of it had to do with the dog's liver. So we worked on helping the dog open up the elimination channels, uh, detoxify the liver, um, get the energy flowing in their dog again so it could help gain weight. We also looked at the diet to make sure the diet was good. We did a slight diet change to a more fresh uh, food diet and um, and added herbs that worked for that dog as an individual. Um, being that the dog, so the person that had the dog was quite, I would say, you know, desperate 
because their dog was failing and you know when they ate like an 80 70 to 80 percent hair loss you know you you really don't know what to do and you feel like panicked right um so uh i assured them that you know we could help the dog but it was going to take some time and um so the dog was basically i would say based on and what i'll talk about in a minute is energetics the the person was very desperate so was giving their dog everything that they found or read about hmm. that might help with the dog's skin right um so it was on when it came to me the dog was literally on about 27 supplements hmm. um which i mean it was a list and so we took the dog off everything and then looked at what was going on with the dog energetically and that means, you know, is the dog warm or is the dog cold? And there's also this thing called false heat, where you have a dog that's really deficient and cold, um, but the body starts producing heat, trying to combat some of that cold on the inside. Um, and then the dog gets really warm, where the skin starts to get really warm and stinky and crusty. So, um, we looked at the energetics of the dog and how the dog is an individual and then chose herbs to warm actually the dog from the inside so that the body would stop producing heat and cool the dog down. And now actually um, it's been about, I'd say about six months and uh, the dog's hair is all back. Um, no stinkiness, no crustiness. Uh, furs, furs all filled in. Uh, dog, uh, the dog got to gain weight, um, actually about 13 pounds. And, um, and she's doing really, really well. Wow. So, um, but it, it took some patience and, um, and I think that, uh, my client understands her dog a lot more and, uh, just, you know, that frenzy of trying to find another answer than traditional veterinary care. Um, because they, you know, obviously it wasn't working and, uh, she tried, tried everything, you know, um, but looking at her dog as an individual and figuring out her dog actually was kind of really cold on the inside, um, helped her understand her dog and helped her, helped, you know, us together pick herbs that, that actually really, uh, started healing the root cause. And that's what I do as an herbalist. I help look at the root cause of what's going on. And this would be with, for this dog, it would be, uh, too cold. Got it. So it, it sounds like you take a very individualized approach based on the situation as opposed to, um, you know, I guess, number one, how, you know, how maybe a traditional veterinary practice might approach something by working just on the symptom, for example. But even yeah. even this client, uh, in, in this instance, it seemed like, um, you know, she was interested in taking a more natural approach, but was probably you know, supplement hopping on Amazon of and Google of, you know, what can I do for my dog's skin issue, which is almost, you know, a, a derivative or another way of, of taking the traditional medicine approach of just looking for, you know, the single silver bullet that's going to, to, um, you know, fix everything. And what you're saying is, no, you need to look, you know, like at the body, like an ecosystem and, um, you know, find what is going to has the best chance of working based on what you observe and you use the word energetics. Can you say a bit more about what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, okay, so when you're looking at herbs, right, they enter the body. Um, when herbs enter the body, they start, you know, there a lot of herbs, they'll have an affinity towards a certain organ system in the body. Um, like for instance, a lot of people know about hawthorn well, Hawthorn berries, they have an affinity towards the heart system, the cardiac system. Um, but herbs also, they enter the body and they start balancing out the body. They help assimilate nutrients and support glandular systems and strengthen the immune system. And they start changing the tissues in the environment. So, um, but each herb has an energetic. So some herbs like one that is very popular that people will know is cayenne, right? We all know that cayenne is very hot, okay? I'm a very hot person and I, I cannot eat cayenne. Uh, it makes me very red and irritated and my, you know, I start to sweat. And, um, um, but that's a really good example of an energetic there. 
Um, cayenne's very hot, so you would not want to give that to a dog that that has a hard time uh, maintaining their body temperature and that starts to pant and, and, and that gets overheated. So um, herbs basically have an energetic signature, okay? And that that energetic signature is based on principles of of warm, hot, neutral, cool, and cold. And then some herbs are more provide more moisture, so they have more dampness. And then some herbs provide um, an ability to dry out moisture in the body. Um, so that is basically what I'm talking about when I discuss energetics. And is all that based in TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, or is it a, a combination of Ayurveda or other <clears throat> practices? How would you des describe its roots? Um, each, like, um, I actually practice Western medicine, uh, Western uh, herbalism, but like traditional Chinese medicine has their own system of energetics and it is almost the same as Western herbal medicine. Um, and then Ayurveda also has uh, its own system of energetics and they are almost the same as ours. The, um, Ayurveda, I'm not going to get into that, but it looks at things a little differently according to things called doshas. So, um, and traditional Chinese medicine, you know, uh, I use a lot of diagnostics uh, based on traditional Chinese medicine principles, um, based on the organ systems, but um, no, uh, it's just, uh, uh, for me, it's just Western herbal medicine, yeah. Got it. Now, I imagine, you know, this is, a, it's a pretty, you know, complex and there's no one, one size fits all approach of, as we're kind of aligning on here. So, you know, maybe, is there a way to, you know, let, let's say there's a pet parent out there who's interested in taking a more, you know, energetic and herbalistic, that's even a word, um, approach towards, towards their dog. What are, what are some of the questions that they should ask either themselves or their healthcare professional or you or someone like you when considering an approach like this? Or maybe it makes sense to just well, take, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say, so um, if you're looking at your dog, I think the best thing to do is try to get to know your dog as an individual. And one of the things that energetics can do is they give structure to the symptoms that your dog is having and helps you choose herbs more, more like wisely uh, so that you bring the herb and the dog together. And I think like, I'll give you an example. Um, Okay, so a lot of people know what a dandelion is, all right? So let's just talk about, I think this will help people understand energetics. So dandelions um, are cooling, and they also are very drying to the body, okay? So their energetic signature is they're cooling and drying. And so you don't want to give dandelions to a dog that is more on the cold side, that's frail and deficient, and dry so like a dry coat you'd see dry crusting and i'll just go over like basic energetics like different symptoms that you can figure out if your dog is if your dog is um cool or warm um but like dandelion you wouldn't want to give to a cool dog because it is going to make their condition worse um so uh, whereas a lot of people might think oh dandelion i heard it was really great and just give it to their dog um if a dog eats a dandelion, it's different. I'm talking about like more of a tincture, dandelion tincture, or like giving the, giving them as a supplement each mm -hmm. daily, um, uh, like a daily supplement. So um, like, I think the best thing to do is try to figure out your dog as an individual. So let's just say, you know, what does a warm or to hot dog look like? Like, how do I know if my dog is warm to hot? Um, there's a few things to look at. So you would check their head. You know, does my dog consistently and not after exercise um, have a warm head? Like, for instance, there's a little bulldog sitting right next to me right now. If I reach down and touch his head, how does his head feel? He's just sitting there napping. Um, the, actually, I, I do know this dog is quite warm. So I touch his head. His head is warm. His feet, his paws are going to be warm. Um, he's always looking to uh, lay down on cool places. He doesn't really like a lot of dog beds because they're kind of hot for him. So he lays on the cool tile floor. 
He's in the shade when the sun's out. Uh, he never likes to be covered up. Like if you cover, cover him up and all oh, a little sweet baby, you know, he'll in a few minutes, he's going to climb out from underneath that blanket and go lay somewhere else. Um, excessive panting. Uh, you know, if you say, Oh, my dog, my dog really overheats in the summer. You know, he hates being in the heat. It's weird because it's such a nice day out. Um, your dog might have some problems with being too warm. Um, exercise intolerance. A lot of warm dogs have yellow discharge, uh, like a yellow uh, kind of like uh, coated eyes in the morning that you kind of have to clean out. Um, a lot of warm dogs have a really like vivacious appetite, excessive hunger. And then um, some warm dogs are very restless and anxious and nervous or like those dogs that like to kind of get in your face and be like, hey, hey, what are you doing? Ah. Um, a lot of those dogs are warm. Um, loose stool. Uh, and oh, and, and like dogs that are very prone to um, getting hot spots in the springtime um, or in the summer. And then uh, some dogs with excessive lipomas also can be hot. But What's you can lipoma? also see lipomas in cool dogs. A lipoma, so it's a fatty tumor. Okay. Um, you see a lot of them, like fine runners and older dogs. Um, the little fatty cysts under the skin that kind of move around, Got it. and they get they tend to uh, can get very big. Um, those dogs tend to be more warm. Um, so can so I, can I, okay. those are a few. Those are a few symptoms. Go ahead. Okay, so those are kind of a few signs of that you might have a warm dog. So let's say there's a listener out there and says that yeah. totally fits my dog and uh you know he or she yeah. doesn't have any other problems maybe they're a little itchy or something else but you know they're not limping they're not uh down in the dumps and you know they're not not being their usual self everything else is normal but you know okay my dog is warm what are some just you know general practice yeah. kind of like ongoing you know day-to-day -day good herbs for to be in the regimen of a uh, you know a warm dog and at like what kind of frequency or how would you just generally care for a warm dog, a warm but healthy dog? Well, one of the things that uh, kind of the thing, kind of like what not to do basically, okay. because if they're a warm dog and they're not hot, like, you know, that has a range. It goes from like slightly warm, warm, slightly hot, hot. Now hot is more of a disease state. You know, you're going to be, your dog is going to be, going to be probably sick from something. So if your dog's just basically warm, yeah, he just tends to be warm. Um, what you're going to not want to do is you're, you're going to like avoid herbs like that are warming, um, like turmeric. Um, and turmeric is a big thing right now. You know, everyone give their dog turmeric. Unfortunately, it can really make a warm dog miserable. Um, you're going to want to avoid things like garlic and ginger and cayenne and anything that you know is warming. Um, uh, and then focus on things that are more cooling, like, and also like their diet. So you, with a warm dog, you want to avoid things like lamb. Um, lamb is in the, like one of the hottest meats along with venison. Um, and you want to focus more on things like beef and pork and bison um, and like white fish where a warm dog, you want to kind of avoid things like salmon. Salmon is a very hot um, fish. Um, so you kind of want to uh, focus on things that are more cooling. Uh, uh, warm dogs really love things like cucumbers um, added to their food or cucumber water is excellent in the summer to help cool your dog. Um, you just organic cucumbers soaked in water, feed them the water afterwards that they, a warm dog will love drinking that water and it will mm. actually make a dog stop panting in about 15 minutes. Um, uh, green vegetables, green veggies, uh, blend it up, add it into the food a few times a week will help cool the dog. Whereas a cooler dog isn't going to be that interested in a lot of green veggies because a lot of green veggies besides things like spinach, spinach is a little warming. Um, well, they're not going to be interested in those because they know that it, it's, it's too cold for them. So yeah, so just focus on, and if you want to give herbs, focus on herbs that you can find out if they're neutral or if they're more cooling like um, uh, dandelions are nice for warm dogs. Uh, uh, chickweed and cleavers are herbs that you can use very non-toxic. Um, you don't have to worry too much about dosages um, if you're feeding those things fresh. 
uh, during the summer months or during the spring. Um, milk thistle, things like that would be okay for that dog. Got it. And so in your product line on farm, farm dog naturals, how is this, uh, you know, temperature and moistness, dryness um, reflected farm, in, what's farm that? Dog is just, farm dog is only an external um, product line, okay. so it doesn't really uh, adhere to, and it's just for like um, skin conditions and cleaning okay. and calming a dog down and yeast. So, Got it. but they're all external. But on my website, canineherbalist.com, I have some uh, herbal tinctures and some things called gemotherapies that um, do go by or energetics. Okay. Well, I was wondering, if maybe I can put myself and you on the spot a bit with, so I have a line of supplements that are specially designed for golden retrievers, which are made, which are in honor of my dog, Sonny. So, Excellent. you know, you know, listeners probably know the story, but long story short, when I went off the military, Sonny was, he was happy, he was healthy, but he was 11 or so. And, you know, I thought I'd see him again um, when I came home for Christmas, but he went downhill too fast. I didn't get the chance. And, you know, of course, since then, I've been in the human side of the natural supplement space. And I, I just noticed that, you know, the ingredient quality in most dog supplements wasn't really up to par, at least up to my standards. And so, you know, my, my partners and I created this product. So maybe I could go down the list and um, have yeah. you actually, you know, probably an easier thing is I will bring it up on screen share so that you can see the full list. And we'll kind of go down the list and you can say, Hey, you know, not necessarily good or bad, but maybe, you know, right or wrong or, or not even that, but you know, to, here's some things you might think about. Yeah, yeah. Here's some, here's some things you might think about. And, um, you know, so the whole idea was that we would, uh, you know, take, uh, you know, a line of products and turn up the volume in certain areas where golden retrievers need, uh, it most right taking a very breed specific approach and you know every dog is different so it's not like saying every golden retriever is going to be the same but still this was our best our best shot at it so i'll we go do, ahead and we do have some common qualities though so right so i will go ahead and share my screen here so you can see um, the ingredients and then the dosing is um, a different thing so here's what's in forever golden which is a chew we've got organic uh, for those who aren't who aren't um, can't see my screen on YouTube. It's uh, organic alfalfa juice powder, BCM 95 curcumin. So very bioavailable with the essential oils of curcumin, very high purity, um, which of course comes from turmeric, organic reishi mushroom, sensorial ashwagandha, organic maki berry, organic chlorella, l taurine, green lip muscle powder, horsetail extract, which you, um, oh no, you mentioned, and, uh, and hawthorn leaf and flower, which you mentioned. So that's the initial, um, formulation so at the risk of of someone um who who uh, knows herbs picking apart our sunny's formula um go for it rita <laughs> well i mean it's actually quite balanced um it, uh, alfalfa and i love that you used organic alfalfa so that's excellent um the organic alfalfa is cooling uh curcumin is warming reishi is warming um uh, ashwagandha is more on the warming side. Um, I don't know anything about maki berry, but it's probably a little on the cooling side. Um, organic chlorella is cooling. Green lip mussels is very hot. Uh, horsetail is uh, cooling. Hawthorn is uh, kind of neutral. Um, so I'd say that it's balanced in its energetics. Um, you know, it would depend on the only thing that I could say is that you want to watch how much you give your dog of this because of the curcumin extract. So it's not turmeric, it's curcumin mm -hmm. and too much curcumin can leach iron out of the body. Mm. So, um, um, so if you were giving them like all day long, <laughs> which, you know, I have to say that I recently had a pug, uh, dog that, um, was having a major issue um, and it was from the liver treats that it was being given. Mm. Um, and they were giving them like, you know, six times a day and um, it became a real problem. Um, so I, you know, some people do give their dogs like crazy amounts of stuff. Um, but uh, um, I, I don't, I don't foresee it being a problem, but, as far as being, it's enter. You know, you've got a you've got a nice mix of cooling and warming um, treats here. So um, 
you know, one of the things that I can tell, tell you uh, that I guess is very actionable for people, like if they wanted to know if this treat worked for their dog, mm -hmm. um, this is what you do. So you can test anything um, that you give your dog uh, through their mouth that's digested by the gut um, with this, the following test. So what you do is you wait till your dog is relaxed and make sure it's about two hours after they eat their, their meal, whatever meal that is. You can test their meal using this uh, method as well. You feel their ears, and if their ears are nice and, uh, I would say nice and cool, um, give them one of your treats. And then in about 35 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, you're gonna feel their ears again. And if their ears are ob obviously warmer, like, oh, wow, that's a really increase in temperature, you know? Like very obvious increase in temperature, no go. It's actually causing inflammation. Hmm. So that's an inflammatory response. But if they don't increase in temperature or if it's just slight, like, oh, I'm not sure if it increased, right? Then it didn't because it's very obvious. And um, you can test a carrot with that. You can test broccoli with that. You can test uh, some lamb. You can test anything you want with that. So, uh, um, a lovely uh, veterinarian uh, taught me that in Minneapolis, mm. Minnesota about 25 years ago. And I've been using it ever since. Is oh. it 100% foolproof? No, it's not. But it's just, I found it just as effective as like a saliva test for mm. allergies and food sensitivities. So it's a really good way to find out, hey, do, are these treats working? Are these treats having causing inflammation in my dog? And um, um, and that's an easy way to find out, but those treats are actually quite nicely balanced. Okay. Well, as thank far you. as energy. Yeah. So it sounds yeah. like, you know, I was a little nervous. I was like, oh God, hey, oh I God was little... what is he going to have in those treats? Am I going to, yeah, yeah, no, actually they're, they're quite balanced. The only thing that's really hot in them is the green lip muscle. Green lip muscle. And, and the curcumin is more warming. Yeah. Like you said. Curcumin is warming. Yeah. Got it. And, and the curcumin is an extract of turmeric. So it doesn't have. It doesn't have, like for instance, alfalfa isn't an extract. Um, the curcumin doesn't have the constituents, the ingredients in that you'd find in turmeric that help cancel out the side effects of the, the, the extract. So um, that's why curcumin causes more issues where like it can leach iron from, it can take iron from the body, um, whereas turmeric doesn't. Um, but it doesn't right. do it that often. And it would take a lot of, turmeric to do it yeah it a would lot be, it so would be, it would be interesting with with this one to see um you know to what extent that is the case or isn't the case because the curcumin extract that we use is probably the most premium form on the market and it, it actually contains the bioavailable oils that do come from the turmeric whereas most curcumin like you said is just curcumin so this this curcumin while it is an extract and is standardized to that curcumin dose does contain other volatile oils that are normally in the turmeric. And so maybe those still have at least some of a balancing effect. Yes, at least that was our, our hope. So now I guess the interesting thing is you know, we put curcumin in there in order to have a, an ant, uh, you know, a healthy in, support a healthy inflammation response. So how does, mm -hmm. how does that work? How can, you know, something like that, that is, you know, known even clinically, you know, scientifically with, with studies to reduce inflammation, potentially result in inflammation in certain cases. What's your take on that? Well, it's okay. So curcumin extract is what is known as standardized herbalism. Okay. And even if you add some of the more essential oils that are in turmeric, um, it still lacks probably over a thousand constituents that's in turmeric that's not in that extract. Okay. So whoever is coming, most of the people that work in a science lab that come up with these standardized extracts right they are completely thinking allopathically because we've been conditioned to do so so they're looking at herbs as they would pharmaceuticals and they're treating them as they would pharmaceuticals so in order to actually have some science-based medicine on turmeric um, you have to have a standardized extract because a plant is going to vary in its constituents from crop to crop and that's not how pharmaceuticals work and that's not how you can't, do, you can't do a clinical trial 
with that type of medicine. So it has to be standardized. Okay. So energetically, um, for whomever it was tested on, you're going to have a certain amount of people that it does work excellent as an anti-inflammatory. In fact, curcumin extract with, um, I think it's called Mariva, um, uh, saved my mother from a knee replacement. Hmm. She takes it every day. Um, and it's an excellent anti-inflammatory when the energetics are correct. But my same friend, Sue, uh, tried to take it. She's a very hot person, very warm person. Uh, made her miserable and did not work at all. No anti-inflammatory dosage could be found for her. Hmm. Um, it's because energetically it's off. Okay, so um, she could have possibly not as been as miserable on it if it would have been balanced by more cooling herbs. But still, if it's causing an, an inflammatory response, um, it's not going to work. So, right. it, and that's the thing about herbs. People, when you think about them allopathically and pharmaceutically, you're thinking, well, well, herbs just don't work because I tried this herb for my dog and it just didn't work. It, you know, it made him worse. And it was like, that's because that herb wasn't for your dog. It's not because herbs don't work. It's because that herb was not for your dog. So yes, out of a very high amount of dogs, your treat is going to work great. And then some some dogs, it's not going to work. That anti-inflammatory aspect that you mm -hmm. want, it's just not going to work. Will it make them miserable? I think the alfalfa and the horsetail and the chlorella, um, the chlorella is nice and cooling, um, will help balance some of that heat. But um, And overall, I think it's an excellent supplement. I mean, actually, it's really nice. But um, uh, yeah, it, you're not going to have that anti-inflammatory effect on every single dog. Got it. Okay. So that's why... That's why it is known. It has been proven in a standardized way. Okay. Yes. Well, glad we did that little exercise. So we talked about a warm, um, you know, some of the signs that a dog is warm. What about a the signs a dog is cool? Um, okay. So uh, hold on, I need to. I don't know what happened. Oh, there you are. I lost you for a minute there. Are you there? <laughs> I'm here. Are you, are you there? Okay. I'm sorry. Here. Yeah. Hope I did. Okay. Hold on. I, I think I hit a wrong button. You're fine on my side, so you can just keep talking. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Oh, you're back. Oh, I hit that. I'm sorry. I hit the wrong button. I apologize. No problem. Um, so, do you want to ask me that again? Yes. Um, we talked about a warm dog. So, what are some signs that you someone has a cool dog? Okay. So, cool dogs... Um, when, when you have warm dogs, you have like excitability, okay? So what uh, an herbalist would call excitation. So there's lots of energy going on. So a cool dog, you're going to see a lack of energy, you know, a lack of vitality, kind of, you know, your cool dude dog. Um, and so everything kind of is slower. And so you've got slower digestion. Sometimes they have malabsorption issues or undigested food in the stool. Um, they're, cons they're consistently, you can touch their ears and paws and they're quite like not warm at all or cool. Um, they love to be covered up. They love to sit in the sun and soak up the sun and, and they really love to be warm and they're always trying to cuddle. Um, they can kind of have poor circulation. Uh, um, they're kind of prone to yeast infections um, or kind of being yeasty. Uh, a lot of times they might have hypothyroid, um, uh, things like that. But the biggest thing, like cool dogs really will seek out warmth, like consistently. They're like, I want to be warm. Can you cover me up? I want to sleep under the blankies. I want to lay in the sun. I, you know, they'll find that one ray of sun in the house uh, that's coming through the window and they will be, it'll be there. They'll be in there, you know, just, and they don't want to leave it. And they always want to be snuggled. Um, and they really are cool to the touch. Um, and they're just dogs that some, like when they're cold, they, they're, they're very lethargic. Um, and cool dogs get skinny. They, they're hard to keep weight on. They're not, they're hardly ever fat. Um, and uh, they don't have, they don't drink as much water. They might have a lack of thirst. They might be more constipated. Um, 
uh, you know, kind of maybe going to the bathroom every other day or just once a day. Um, uh, things that just more stagnant, but you know, the energy isn't moving through them like a very excited dog. And so what are some, you know, daily or ongoing herbs that might benefit a cool dog? Um, anything that's warming. So like, you know, one thing that I love for cool dogs is ginger tea and it's mm. super easy for anyone to make. You just get some fresh ginger, you shred it, you make a nice hot tea, maybe 30 minutes, strain it and put a little bit on, uh, on, on the food. And I like to do like bowl appropriate. So like if you had an, a little cool, um, let's say chihuahua, you know, their bowls about this big, um, you know, just tablespoon maybe and then as you like golden retriever golden retriever for ginger tea would be probably a quarter cup you know if you got a a big great dane probably a cup on like mixed in with the food um that's a really easy one um anything that's kind of warm ashwagandha is nice uh especially if your dog has a, like a thyroid issue it's really good for for a slower thyroid um, it helps dogs deal with everyday stress because a lot of dogs feed off our energies in our house. You know, they're very in tune with us. Um, ashwagandha is nice. Um, uh, echinacea um, is also good. Like in the winter months, um, uh, spinach. Spinach is more warming if you want to give them a green. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of of warming herbs. There's a herb called self-heal that is real nice um, to add. Um, but Oh, I'm sorry. One of my favorite herbs for warming is um, for warming a dog is calendula. Mm. Uh, calendula. Um, a lot of people know about calendula. Calendula is very warming. It warms the core. So it helps dogs that are cool, just maintain a warm temperature. So things don't get out of, out of whack and uh, imbalanced. And you can get calendula as a, a tincture. Um, it's a very resinous um, plant, so it doesn't really do good as like a, a dried herb. Um, but, you know, like for, I would say, let's say a golden retriever, it would, my dosage for a golden retriever would probably be about four drops twice a day, like little, little individual drops. And you could do it in their mouth or in their food. Um, or you could, you could do a dried herb if you want, but I don't, it's not as beneficial, but it is good as a, as a hot tea, like the ginger, but yeah, ginger and ginger and calendula are like my two go-tos for warming up a, a, a cool dog. Okay, great. Well, in the limited time we have here, um, I'll have two more questions. One of them is, um, do you have any favorite sources for favorite quality sources for herbs? Many of the ones that you've mentioned, is there any good one-stop shop? Um, I like Herb Farm, uh, H-E-R-B as in boy, P-H-A-R-M.com. Um, you can find some of liquid herbs on my website, uh, canineherbalist.com. Um, uh, Mountain Rose Herbs for dried or oh, yeah. herb bulk herbs. And then also, you know, locally, people growing um, uh, farmer's markets are excellent for fresh herbs. Yeah, yeah but Herb Farm tinctures are good. Really I remember good. Mountain Rose um, from a while back. They're in Minnesota, aren't they? Nope, they're in Oregon. Oregon. And they've been around for a really long time. Okay. Oh, I'm thinking of Wilderness Family Naturals. I think they're in Minnesota. But okay, oh, Mountain Rose. Minnesota. Yeah. Great. Well, Rita, this has been awesome. I learned a lot and I got a free critique on Sonny's, put us on the spot there. But I'm really glad we. It's a great treat. Great Thank treat. You. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, and. Uh, yeah, any final advice for our listeners? Um, I guess, you know, when you're looking at trying out herbs, you know, um, see what you can find about the information about them. And when you're looking up herbs, um, like if you were looking up calendula and wanted to know something on about calendula, the best way to look up an herb is to like if, look calendula and then put the word herbalist behind it mm. because you're going to get an herbalist's opinion on uh the plant which will probably give you energetics of the plant mm. um and just try you know one or two herbs at a time don't try to give your dog you know every single herb that you can find on arthritis you know try one and right. herbs usually don't produce results 
for about four to six weeks. Wow. So it, it's nice to know when you should start seeing results. Some can be a matter of a couple of weeks, but don't expect anything major for four to six weeks and try to space your herbs out. Like if you were going to try, let's just say you're going to try ginger and calendula and you knew your dog was cold, right? Very, you know, very cool dog. Try calendula the first week for seven days and then add ginger so that you can find out how your dog reacts to it. Got it. Wow, great advice. So in addition to getting the right dose of, of whatever herb you're working with, the pet parent, him or herself, needs a big old dose of patience. Patience is weeks. number one. Absolutely, four to six weeks. Okay. All right, Rita, thanks so much. This has been great. Um, so Rita Hogan with Canine Herbalist. You can learn all about her at canineherbalist.com. And of course, she has some products also. Her and her co-founder yeah. at farmdognaturals.com. And you can follow Farm Dog at, at Farm Dog Naturals on Instagram. Thanks so much, Rita. You're welcome. Take care. Take care.